Yeah. Yes, I see the the designation. Okay. All right. We're uh, we are on the record, as they say. Um, well, uh, everyone, uh, good afternoon. Um, uh, this is uh, Richard Ift, and I have with me from uh, the Federal Insurance Office at the U.S. Treasury as well, Sherry Roulette and Jeremy Pam. Uh, and also on the line is Mike McCauley of ISO, who is uh, directing the collection and aggregation of data for the Terrorism Risk Insurance Program through the portal that is operated by ISO. Um, as I think you all know, uh, especially those who have done this uh, many times before at this point. This is a joint data call with the uh, state regulators and the NAIC. Uh, Aaron Brandenburg, who manages that process for the NAIC, was unable to, he is traveling today and was unable to be on the webinars. However, as usual, he is coordinating that effort. Um, you will, and we'll talk about this a little later in the webinar, when you report, you will need to upload your completed forms to both the uh, portal managed by ISO for U.S. Treasury as well as through a separate portal that's, uh, I guess, managed by uh, the, US, uh, the, the New York Department. Um, so in any event, that, that, and that process is the same as it's been in the past. Um, again, the purpose of this uh, data call, it is uh, required uh, by Section 111 of the 2015 uh, TRIP, Terrorism Risk Insurance Program Reauthorization Act, which is now Section 104H1 of TRIA. Uh, it is designed to provide Treasury with a data set that it will use to periodically analyze, among other things, the effectiveness of the program and the competitiveness of small insurers in the terrorism risk insurance market. Uh, state regulators have determined to collect similar information for the regulatory purposes addressed by state regulators with respect to insurers under their supervision. Treasury and state regulators are continuing to coordinate in this effort with a consolidated approach that allows reporting insurers, for the most part, to provide the same data set to Treasury uh, through ISO and state regulators through the portal operated by New York State and thereby satisfy their production obligations to both through provision of the same data to each. Um, Again, I don't know at this point whether there are any separate requirements that uh, the state regulators are requiring this year. I'm actually not aware of any, but obviously that will be highlighted on the NAIC web uh, site. And if there are any, Aaron Brandenburg can uh, alert you to those. Um, this year, the regulatory due date for the annual data call is uh, May 16th, uh, a day later than usual. It's usually May 15th. but uh, the 16th falls on a Sunday, so uh, the due date is uh, Monday the 16th. Uh, that date uh, has been set in light of uh, uh, FIO's statutory obligation to provide a report to Congress concerning the program each year on June 30th. Because of that reporting deadline on our part, we are unable to extend the time for insurers responding to the data call beyond May 16th. So we, we do encourage you uh, to uh, do your absolute very best to get that data in by the 16th. Um, as has been the case in prior years, we are doing separate webinars for each of the four reporting templates uh, for small insurers, non-small insurers, alien surplus lines insurers, and captive insurers. Uh, this is the webinar addressing non-small insurers, which for the purposes of this year are all insurance groups or individual companies, if you're not part of a group of companies writing trip eligible lines of insurance, that had in calendar year 2020 direct earned premium of $1 billion or more written in trip eligible lines or alternatively, a policyholder surplus of one billion or more. Um, given the terms of the 2019 reauthorization of TRIA, this threshold should, should now continue to remain the same at one billion for both measures until the current expiration of the date of the program, which is now uh, the end of 2027. Um, please keep in mind that if you are near the breakpoint for premium purposes and are otherwise under the threshold for surplus, as you have to be under it for both, 
that certain premium allocated to lines for state reporting purposes is not TRIP eligible. Uh, for example, there's personal lines premium in some of the lines. Uh, I'm thinking particularly fire and allied lines and, and professional liability insurance premium within other liability is not TRIP eligible. So please make sure to evaluate that before concluding whether you should report on the small insurer form or the non-small form, uh, which requires the production of more information. Uh, otherwise, we are conducting this particular webinar today based upon the requirements in the non-small insurer template, which hopefully you are all now seeing up on the screen. If you do fall into the small insurer category, we will be holding a webinar focused on that template later this afternoon at 3 o'clock Eastern. Uh, tomorrow, we will hold the webinars for Alien Surplus Lines insurers, which is scheduled for 11 a.m. Eastern, and captive insurers, which is scheduled for 3 o'clock p.m. Eastern. Um, this year's collection does contain certain changes to the data reporting templates related to captive insurers, which should not be relevant to this group, as well as to insurers that write cyber insurance on either a standalone or package basis. Uh, to the extent you do not write cyber insurance, you will find that the templates are pretty much identical to last year's, uh, subject to a new model loss question uh, for this year, although, again, that question is similar in format to those that have been posed in prior years. Uh, and we will, we will address the changes to the cyber form a little later in the webinar once we get to it. Um, Again, remember that reporting is on a group basis, which is how TRIP operates. You only report for an individual company if you are not affiliated with another company writing TRIP-eligible lines of business. Uh, also, keep in mind that any alien surplus lines insurers that are part of a group should be reporting within that group. The only alien surplus lines insurers that should be reporting on the separate alien surplus lines template are those which are not affiliated with a non-small or small group. Uh, the process uh, for getting started here is, uh, I hope, <laughs> precisely the same as in prior years and is pretty straightforward. Uh, you need to go to the website, which is uh, www.tripsection111data.com uh, and download the registration form. You will email this registration form to the address provided and the point of contact listed on your registration form will receive an email from ISO with a link to a secure portal that will contain your required reporting form. Once you re complete the uh, reporting forms, you will send it back to ISO through the same secure portal. And again, as I mentioned earlier, although this is a consolidated data call, you will then need to also separately submit your completed reporting forms to the New York portal for state reporting purposes. Uh, we do not basically share the forms back and forth uh, between Treasury and the state, so uh, just please uh, upload the same forms to both portals. Uh, the forms will be provided to you in Excel format. However, if you prefer to report using a CSV form of report, you can elect for that and ISO will provide you with specifications that allow you to report in that format instead. Um, Mike, uh, you are on the line. I wanted to sort of give you an opportunity to uh, sort of any, to advise the group on any status issues from your standpoint and just any, any other thing you might want to uh, provide. Thank you, Richard. Um, yeah, just wanted to, quickly touch base as to the status on registrations. All registrations for non-small insurers that were received prior to 3 p.m. Eastern yesterday have been processed and you should have received the secure email containing your SFTP credentials to access the data templates. If you have not received that information, um, you can feel free to reach out to me directly or to the uh, shared address that I will provide in the chat function shortly after this. Um, and I think that's just a quick update I have there, Richard. And I'll turn it back okay. to you. Uh, thanks, Mike. And um, this would normally be the point where Aaron Brandenburg tells you to make sure to uh, 
uh, uh, the same forms to the state regulators. Uh, obviously, you, you should do that. Uh, submitting them to us will not satisfy those requirements equally. And this has happened before, too. Submitting them only to the New York uh, portal doesn't get your uh, information into Treasury. So uh, please just recall to make sure to do that on both ends. Um, as was the case last year, and actually for a number of years prior to that, if you write in the workers' compensation line, uh, NCCI, the California WCIRB, and the New York Compensation Insurance Rating Board will report in the workers' compensation fields for those companies that report workers' compensation data to state regulators, which will then be merged into the data that you are otherwise reporting. Um, NCCI will otherwise coordinate with the rating bureaus in the states in which it does not operate other than New York and California. They actually do that separately for us. So we will be getting comprehensive nationwide information. Um, the one exception here is that NCCI and the rating bureaus will not register on your behalf, nor will they, or for that matter, can they, uh, complete the questions concerning reinsurance information relating to workers' compensation exposures, which still need to be completed by the insurer. Um, again, you are not otherwise required to complete the workers' compensation fields, which will be reported by the rating bureaus. And this is actually specified as well in the um, uh, in the instructions document, and I'll I'll pivot to one of those be probably before the end of this call. Um, let me see. It, um, oh, in addition, uh, insurers will see, still need to provide data for excess workers' compensation policies because the uh, NCCI and the rating bureaus uh, do not get that information and thus cannot provide that data to us. Again, groups or companies must register even if they only write workers' comp as they will need to fill out the worker reinsurance worksheet separately, and we need that registration to get you into the system in the first instance. Um, our main uh, suggestion here, read the instructions documents, uh, which or instructions document, there's actually one for each uh, separate template, which is identified, which is located on the TRIP website for the non-small insurer form you will be completing. And hazard to uh, make sure that I can uh, try to get you all to that. You should be seeing the TRIP uh, uh, data, uh, data call uh, or annual data call uh, website at this point. Uh, here are the forms here, the non-small instructions. But now you're here. There it goes. And again, so, you know, certainly take a look at that. There is literally an instruction for each uh, data element you are asked to provide. So if you do have any questions, you know, hopefully they uh, can be uh, uh, responded to by the information in that. Uh, I'm now going to go back to the actual recording form. And there we are. Um, Other sources of information uh, for the data call, apart from this webinar, uh, you can obtain specific help in response to a specific question you might have by emailing tripsection111data at iso.com. Uh, if you send such an email, you will either, uh, you will either get a written email response, uh, you will get a call from ISO, or you may get a call from somebody at Treasury. Uh, alternatively, you can also just call Mike McCauley at ISO. Uh, he's at 201-469-2323. Or you can contact me, Richard Ift, at Treasury at 202-341-2501. Or you can contact Sherry Roulette at Treasury. Uh, she is at 202-923-7962. You can also reach me by email at richard.if at treasury.gov or sherry at sherry.roulette, R-O-W-L-E-T-T, at treasury.gov. Um, in addition, we have also generated a sample answer document this year, as we have in past years. This is also located on the 
annual data call website, which I just went back to. This provides examples of how to report various elements, particularly ones that may not be uh, immediately intuitive, and also walks through how the model loss question should be answered. We have also made available on our website a zip code listing for the various areas identified on the geographic exposures worksheet, which should be of assistance in completing that worksheet. Okay, now we are going to walk through each individual worksheet within the non-small insurer template with some explanations as to what we are seeking and suggestions for completing each worksheet. Uh, we will then open it up to individual questions, which you can pose by going, uh, go to the Zoom menu and submit through the chat mechanism of question. Now, if you put the question in, obviously if you hit everybody, everybody gets to see it. If you want to just direct it to, I mean, it's fine if you feel like doing that, we'll obviously respond to that question as well. If you want to maintain some anonymity on the question, uh, direct it to uh, Sherry, you know, Sherry or me, uh, or or both of us, uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll, that means we'll see who's asking the question, but no one else on the webinar uh, will. Uh, you can do this throughout the webinar, and we will go through as many of these as we can at the end after uh, these prepared uh, remarks. Um, okay, we are going to now be walking through the PDF versions of the reporting forms, which are easier to present in this sort of format. Uh, again, once you register, you will be getting or have already received live Excel versions of these sheets which ISO tailors as necessary for each individual group based upon the form it should complete, the jurisdictional worksheets it needs, et cetera. Uh, again, you can also report by providing information in a CSV file format. Again, ISO will provide specifications for that upon request. Um, now, you're uh, all on, uh, hopefully, uh, you're all seeing the uh, first uh, page of the form, the insurer group affiliations uh, worksheet, page one. Uh, this is just basically to identify who you are. Again, uh, reporting is on a group basis unless obviously you are a single company. We do use NAIC company and group codes for tracking purposes. Um, if you are an insurer that does not have such a number for whatever reason, ISO will assign a number to you for tracking purposes. If you have reported before, and I'm sure most, if not all of the people on this call are in that uh, position, please just use the same numbers for company identification that you have used in prior years. Um, an, individual in the comp uh, an individual company in the group that is an alien surplus lines insurer uh, should use the number assigned to it by the International Insurers Department of the NAIC. Um, Regarding, and again, you're uh, looking at these uh, fields here in column G, regarding the total 2020 policyholder surplus, you need to identify that for 2020 for the relevant entities. And understand this is generally a 2021 data call. However, the, the figures in column G essentially address uh, metric issues based on the deductible, and we look at the policyholder surplus in the same year which actually pivots back to the same year before. So while we are asking for 2020 information, well, columns G and H on this one particular sheet, uh, that is simply because we're, we're looking at information relevant to your, uh, your, uh, your 2021 deductible, which goes back to 2020. You need that information later uh, to re uh, rely on the number when responding to questions on the reinsurance worksheet. If you happen to have reported a figure last year that you now believe to be an error based on further evaluation, then just enter the you know revised number this year. Uh, look real quick, see if there's any. Yep. Okay. Um, okay. Moving down to the next page. Oop. All right. Okay, this is uh, page two of the, uh, the non-small form, policy and premium uh, by jurisdiction. 
uh, again, by relevant NAIC, NAIC line or subline. The figures in E, F, and G, columns E, F, and G, should add up. In fact, I believe it's sort of the formulas are structured that way to what will end up being in column D. Um, uh, column H, which is actually, if you are charging terrorism at risk insurance premium uh, uh, charge, that is actually a subset of the total policy uh, earned premium, which is reported in column G. So uh, E, F, and G add up to D. H is a subset of G. Um, when reporting premium, remember also that all the, although the terrorism risk insurance program is defined for most part in terms of NAIC state reporting lines. There are some significant differences that I did allude to before, principally lines one, uh, fire, and two allied lines, uh, but, uh, include both commercial and personal lines coverage. And since uh, TRIP only addresses commercial coverage, any personal lines coverage that you would otherwise report for state reporting purposes needs to be excluded from this data call. Uh, also, uh, uh, professional liabilities uh, or E&O coverage is excluded by statute from TRIP. Uh, however, that for state reporting purposes otherwise refer, uh, falls within other liability. Uh, line uh, 15 here. Um, so you should not include uh, that figure within your any data you report in this data call. Uh, the instructions, uh, which I went to before, do identify the principal differences between the TRIP lines and the NAIC state reporting lines. Uh, again, remember that if you write workers' compensation, and again, that's uh, line, uh, well, it's line, statutory line 16 and line 13 on this worksheet, uh, the figures in that line will be reported by the uh, bureaus that I identified before. Uh, although again, keep remember that you do need, you will need to uh, report on the excess workers compensation line, which is in the line below. Uh, premium should be entered on a direct earned basis for calendar year 2021. This means that if you have a policy that started before 2021 or ended after 2021, uh, you will need to include only the premium that was earned in calendar year 2021 for that policy. If you have a policy that covers multiple states, the premium should be allocated to each state proportionally in the same manner as you would have or did uh, report it for statutory reporting purposes. Um, there are some differences in the way policy count will be entered. Policy count should be pol based on policies issued in 2021 and or still in effect on 12-31-2021. Uh, so a policy in effect from January 1 to December 31, 2021, that's an easy one, that counts as one. If it was issued for, on uh, June 1, 2020 and expired uh, May 31, 2021, that gets counted as a zero. Uh, if it was issued from July 1, 2021 to June 30th, 2022, that gets counted as one. A policy in effect for a multi-year policy for the entire year and still in effect on 12-31-2021 counts as one. Policy count should be done by line in columns I through K and uh, up here, right through here. Um, Oops, lost my place here. Um, so that you'll you will be double counting policies that cover multiple lines. For example, if you have a policy that covers fire and allied lines coverage together, you will enter a policy count of one in each of those lines, along with the premium associated with each line. On line 21, however, uh, provide the total number of policies, and that's the box down here provide the total number of policies containing TRIP eligible lines coverage, which will give us an accurate count of the total number of policies in the state. Uh, there will also be double counting across states if you have policies that cover multiple states. In addition, each policy 
covering multiple states will get entered in each relevant state worksheet. Again, this is there are no fundamental or any changes other than changing the dates of the, the call. So this is, is should be exactly the same as it's been for you in prior years. Okay, the next worksheet um, is uh, the ter um, standalone terrorism coverage worksheet. Um, and that's this one is on a nationwide basis. There's no allocation by states for purposes of this. Again, there are no changes to this worksheet. Um, we do ask here uh, for information on terrorism coverage, both that cover uh, acts of terrorism as certified by Treasury versus other acts of terrorism that are not certified. You know, we do that for comparative purposes. Obviously, we know there's a market, separate market for coverage that uh, would respond to non-certified acts of tre uh, terrorism. Um, but again, other than that, again, no changes from prior years, and this one is. Uh, pretty straightforward. Next screen. All right, here we are. This is the one that has changed significantly from prior years. So I will um, um, walk through this in a little more detail. This is the cyber. Again, it is still on a nationwide um, uh, reporting basis. There's no allocation by state on this one. The information requested here is subject to some additional items that have been requested for the first time in this 2022 data call. So I will go over those fields in some detail. While the categories of information requested have expanded, we are continuing to seek information on both standalone cyber bases, that should be included in column C, and as well as cyber endorsements attached to another policy, uh, and that's um, or is attached as, as part of another, that a policy that provides other coverages, that should be reported in column G. Um, so, as, so Richard, we have a, we have a question. Okay. Uh, um, the question is, it, so if a policy has DEP in 2021, but was not written in 2021, or in effect, 1231-21, it should not be in the count, but it should be in the DEP? Exactly, yes. Uh, the, there's a little bit of a, we, un, we appreciate that, there's a little bit of a disconnect uh, between the policy number reporting requests versus the premium. It does mean you'll be reporting some premium for that policy in association with a policy count number that gets entered as zero, but Ultimately, we determined that to avoid as much double counting on the policy number front as possible, that that's the way it should be done. Um, okay, moving forward on the cyber sheet. Uh, again, as in prior years, you should not, assuming you are still uh, uh, have any exposures here, don't provide any information here on non-affirmative or silent cyber coverage. And again, that would be the extent to which if a policy potentially covers some sort of cyber loss because uh, cyber is not uh, specifically excluded in the policy and is otherwise might be deemed to uh, respond to a cyber event. But again, the idea is there's no specific um, uh, coverage, uh, affirmative coverage provided in that regard. All right, going through the sheet, lines three through six, three through six, well, I'm not gonna be able to do this, highlight this that great, but three through six, eight through nine, and 18 and 19, request information concerning premium, number of policies, and limits for cyber policies in the TRIP eligible lines of insurance that has been previously requested and we are continuing to request. So again, while the, the lines have moved somewhat because we restructured the form a bit, those lines three through six, eight through nine, and 18 through 19 are basically getting at the same sort of information you've requested to report in prior years. So you should continue to respond to those questions uh, as you have in the past. Now, line seven, uh, 
that's the non-TRIP eligible Lyme DEP, uh, 10 and 20 request the same information concerning premium, number of policies, and limits, but as applied to cyber policies, and again, defined as standalone cyber and cyber coverage provided as part of the package policies that are written in non-TRIP eligible lines of insurance. Um, while this inform and again, while this information is the same as the sort of information we request in the past, we have expanded it this year to policies written in the non-TRIP eligible lines so that we can assess the amount of cyber insurance that is currently not subject to the program. Our understanding, uh, we'll see how that plays out, is that this will largely be cyber insurance that is currently being coded, characterized, or otherwise reported for state purposes as professional liability insurance, which is uh, currently subject to a statutory exclusion under TRIA. Um, and, and for that matter, a regulatory, or the way our regulations work, uh, we, we, our regulations specify that if it's in a non-TRIP eligible line as defined in our regulations, then it's not subject to TRIA. So these questions, assuming you are writing some policies, professional lines, uh, or professional, liabil uh, professional liability lines in cyber, uh, if, if you are writing policies coded in this fashion, you should answer in the same way as you have already been responding to the questions of policies written in the trip eligible lines. Now, further down on the worksheet, there are three categories of information that are being requested this year that we will acknowledge have never been requested in the prior trip data calls. These are, and going down to 12, 13, 12 through 17, uh, yep, these are, well, well, that's a little too far there, but 12 through 17, premium and number of policies allocated by the size of the policyholder, and that size is measured by its number of employees, uh, lines 21 through 24, there, 21 through 24, that's seeking limits information specific to cyber extortion and ransom payments. And finally, going on to the next page of the document, lines 25 through 30 is actually seeking loss information specific to cyber extortion and ransom uh, payments. Now, I'm going to and pivot back to the instruction sheet quickly. We'll take a minute. Uh, in the instructions form. And while there are specific instructions on each of those lines, we have included um, a general instruction relevant to this worksheet. Uh, again, it's well, the first bullet and the sub-bullets basically just identify those new categories of information. And I'm just going to read this for now. I mean, this is, I mean, we put, put it in there as sort of this is our thinking on this at this point. Uh, to the extent insurer has not been collecting this information, connection with its operations, and, and can't capture this information in any way, uh, you're obviously, you're not being required to, um, uh, provide that in connection with this data call. I mean, we did get uh, comments uh, when we made the or proposed the change that some insurers simply, for example, uh, weren't capturing information on the size of their policyholders by number of employees. Um, obviously, we're, if you didn't do that, we're, we are not asking you to go back and do a poll of your policyholders to report that information. So. Um, you know, if you don't have the existing capability to do that, then you know we're not looking for that. Uh, I, I would I would like to think that on as for loss information and policy limits information, you do have that information captured someplace. But again, the same you know information requires there. If for some reason you weren't capturing it uh, and us can't extract it from your systems, don't. Um, you know, you are not required to report it this year. That will not be the case next year. 
Uh, and again, the determination not to report information this year because of information, because of your existing capabilities is subject to the same verification that you provide when you're providing all of this information, which is, quote, it is as a full and true statement of the information provided uh, to the best of your uh, knowledge, information, and belief. So, so information. Research, we, ha yeah. we, we, have yep. we have another question. Yep, go ahead. If we aren't capturing policyholder size, but have a good idea, such as the majority would be small, should we provide our best estimate or leave blank rows 12 through 17? I am, again, from the standpoint of, I am fine with if you think you can, if you think you've got a pretty good handle on where that, pre, where your premium falls on those categories, uh, I have no, pro, I mean, a, a best estimate that you are, are comfortable with providing, uh, I'm, we're okay with that. I mean, you know, so if, if a company can do it that way as a best estimate, then that's fine. But, you know, if, you know, if you believe that it would take basically too many assumptions to get to whatever the proper allocation is on those amounts, and, and you weren't capturing the information otherwise, then, you know, obviously we don't want you to, uh, you know, provide, you know, data, which really isn't good data. But, you know, I mean, obviously you have the best sense of your operations than anybody. If you believe even in the absence of, you know, the ability to query your system and say, uh, we know based upon what we do that, basically all of our policyholders are going to be in the, whatever the, the lowest one, I think it's one to a hundred employee category, then yes, by all means, please put those numbers in those columns. And uh, again, uh, just last on the instructions, uh, it, you know, if you have any further issues on this, I mean, look, we, we, I, I hope for those of us, uh, those of you who have engaged with us in the past, we, we try to be as responsive as we can. We appreciate this is a burden to do, um, but you know it's a burden that Congress has, requires us to do. So, if you have any further issues on this, you know, please, please reach out to me or to Mike uh, or or Sherry. Uh, we will. We are happy to engage with you on any individual issues you might have. And you know, hopefully, we'll all get to a good place on uh, getting this done for this year. Uh, obviously, so you know, if you go ahead, um, uh, we have a couple more questions. Okay. So the first question is: Please confirm. Did you say that if a company does not capture number of employees now, we don't have to report this year, but next year it will have to be reported? Yeah, we're not, this is not a, uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, look, the, the, this is now a, a data, a, we would expect any company that wasn't capturing them in the past, given this, you know, now fully advertised and required data element, that you should be capturing it now, such that when we get to the 2023 data call for 2022, this should not be an issue. Okay, and the second question is, okay, in the fields that are okay to submit as blank, if there is no best estimate, would be any field that is new this year? Um, new this year, but I would say on the yes, although I wouldn't, I wouldn't extend that new this year um, um, thing to the uh, non-trip eligible lines premium. I mean, you know, I, just because we haven't responded, we haven't asked for it before. I mean, if you're responding for the trip eligible lines, it's sort of, I, it, it, it seems to me at least that it would be, you certainly should have the same cyber premium information for, you know, any, if you are writing cyber in non-trip eligible line, uh, I wouldn't, we would certainly expect that information should be available. Um, 
I mean, frankly, to be perfectly honest, we, we do appreciate on the number of employees, we get it that, you know, folks may not have been capturing it before. That may not be, um, you know, something that they determined was something they needed when underwriting the policies. We would ask you to capture that in the going forward and report that information for us. I mean, look, the other question, the other line elements we would certainly think are, are is information that you should be capturing. I mean, rest relate to limits and losses, which obviously are pretty critical to any insurer. So, um, you know, on the on the on the uh, size of policyholders, yeah, we get that. If you're basically telling us you can't report on your limits or ransomware payments or you know, your extortion limits or payments. And I'll, I'll go over that a little more when we go back to the form, because I, you know, there have been some questions raised as what you're actually looking for there. I mean, we'll talk about that. But again, it, it seems to us that um, you know, those are elements that surely you have to be capturing in some way, shape, or form. Uh, and again, if you're not, or if there's some issue with that, uh, happy to engage with you offline and separately, and we can talk about that and basically what's the way forward. Uh, Jerry, anything um, else in way of questions right now, or can I go back to the form? Uh, no further questions right now. Okay, let's get back to the cyber form. Okay. Going back down to the cyber form. So, okay, regarding the new information, um, premium and number of policies allocated by size of policyholder measured by number of employees. Again, re re that's requesting information for all cyber policies, and we're not asking you here to break it out between TRIP and non-TRIP eligible lines. You can just sort of provide a, a consolidated estimates or figures. Um, these size categories are the same as those utilized by the NAIC for its business interruption data calls associated with the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I'm sure many of you on this call probably uh, needed to respond to those. So it's the same size classification. Uh, so that, that's where we're, we're, what we're looking for there. Again, assuming you have the information available, we assume that the reporting should be straightforward, although you know, we've, we've responded to some extent to the issue presented for carriers that may uh, not have uh, captured that information to date. Um, regarding the new information uh, concerning limits specific to cyber extortion and ransom payments, we have gotten some questions on this. The distinction we are drawing is between coverage for cyber extortion generally, which we understand can contain many policy benefits apart for payment or reimbursement of an actual ransom payment versus the limits for the actual ransom payment. To the extent there's no distinction here. I mean, if, you, if you're issuing a policy that literally has, here's my limit for cyber and it would apply to any loss, whether it's, you know, response to a ransomware situation, whether it's payment of the ransom, whether it's some other, you know, whether it applies to all other uh, benefits potentially provided to your policy. If it's simply one limit fits all and it would apply to anything, then, you know, you're in luck. You would just simply uh, report that limit for any of those questions. What we're getting here at it, what we're getting at here is if your policy draws a distinction, and we've certainly been advised that some insurers do that, you know, if for particularly a, the actual payment of a ransom, you might have a sublimit of fifty thousand dollars. We will pay no more uh, than fifty thousand dollars to actually respond to the ransom, but in terms of the, all the other things that you know you might pay in connection with a ransomware incident, i.e., you know, loss con other loss control services, uh, basically, you know, uh, 
crisis management type things in connection with the ransomware situation, then that's what we're getting at there. Uh, again, you know, we're, we don't really know the answers to these questions. We presume you might have some distinctions there. If you do, that's what we're looking for. Uh, if you don't, then that's, um, that, that's easier. You simply report the, the same limit. And again, in the last, um, oh, we, and we are requesting this information uh, separately here for policies in the TRIP versus non-TRIP eligible lines. Finally, in the last category, loss information specific to cyber and ransom payments, uh, we are requesting this for all cyber policies combined, whether in TRIP eligible lines or not. The questions seek uh, paid and incurred amounts for cyber extortion generally and paid amounts for ransom payments along with the number of claims uh, such ransom payments are associated with. And finally, direct defense amounts for cyber extortion generally um, without any effort to segregate that to ransom, uh, ransom payments specifically are sought in a, on a paid and incurred basis. Um, we appreciate that this is a lot of new information. I mean, I don't need to explain to anybody on this call the, the significance of the current ransomware situation that this country and certainly the insurance industry is facing. We're obviously trying to get ahead of that and get better and more complete information on that. We believe that all of these are concepts that insurers writing in the cyber space should be very cognizant of at this point. But again, we are more than happy to respond to further questions at the end of this webinar, uh, the prepared remarks, uh, and we'll you know, continue to take specific questions directed to us uh, individually if you want to contact us separately. Um, okay, moving to the next uh, form uh, sheet, exposures by jurisdiction. Um, this again, uh, uses the NAIC reporting lines or sublines. We're asking you to identify the exposures both covered by and not covered by TRIP. The point here is to calculate the actual total potential exposure under the policy in both cases. The idea is what is the most you might have to pay under the policy in question. This worksheet also requests for the property and liability exposures, the specific identification of terrorism policy limits where NBCR risks, nuclear, biological, chemical, and radiological risks, are not excluded entirely. Thus, in column D, um, for property, you are requested uh, to identify the property limits for terrorism risk insurance where uh, coverage is provided. In column E, you're requested to take those, so, those same limits, essentially, and tell us uh, in how, how much of those limits is, uh, is NBCR coverage not totally excluded. So uh, column E should presumably be a subset of the figure in column D, or certainly at least no more than the figure in column D. Uh, the same questions are found in columns I and J for liability policies. Report that limits are available uh, for NBCR risk if the policy provides terrorism risk coverage for any NBCR exposures, even if some exposures, and for example, nuclear, might be excluded so long as others, uh, chemical, radiological, are provided. Um, however, if the only NBCR coverage that you believe is provided by your policy or might be provided by your policy is on, a, on the account of so-called fire following laws, which apply in certain jurisdictions, um, then you can you then re, uh, re, report that no coverage is provided. We, we know about the fire following laws, obviously, and we can assess that separately based on uh, what state the, the coverage is in. We also request here information on policyholder deductibles or self-insured retentions which should be reported in connection with primary level uh, policies that reference such a deductible or SIR obligation. Uh, don't report such obligations in connection with high level excess policies or we end up getting a lot of double counting. 
for policies which contain multiple deductibles or SIRs by jurisdiction, depending upon the property, location, or operation, use the lowest deductible or SIR by state. Uh, similarly, for the on the sheet for the United States of, as a whole, use the lowest policy deductible or SIR. Um, there are some differences in the way exposure information is calculated as compared to the policy and premium count information that we talked about before and there was a question about. Here, the exposure metric should be reported, well, first on a jurisdiction by jurisdiction basis and enter the relevant limits for each jurisdiction, even if an aggregate limit might cap your, lim your exposure across multiple jurisdictions. For example, if you had a million dollar policy covering uh, property in Oregon and, and uh, California and Oregon, you would report one million of exposure on both the California and Oregon worksheets, even though there may be an overall limit on that policy of one million. However, on the US worksheet, here we would ask you to uh, provide that total one million limit, assuming it would only apply once on that particular policy. Um, for the purposes of this worksheet, apply the exposure figures as they existed for policies in force as, to, as of 12-31-2021. So that's a little different from the policy count, uh, which you know, could also include policies issued in 2021 but expiring before December 31, 2021. If a policy ends before 12-31, the exposure in this worksheet will be zero. Uh, in addition, once again, the rating bureaus will provide payroll information for the workers' compensation line. However, uh, payroll information applicable to excess workers' comp will need to be supplied by the reporting group or company. Uh, the next sheet is policy holder industry code. Uh, here, we ask you to classify property premium by your choice of NAICS, SICK, uh, see, NAICS, SICK, or other uh, codes. Again, note that the workers' compensation fields will be completed by the rating bureaus using the NCCI coding system. Um, we understand that there can be hundreds of codes within general categories, but we, we do ask that you provide the specific code where available, and ISO will aggregate this information into more general categories as needed for our analysis. Note, um, there is an uncoded NA unavailable field. We did not put that in here to simply allow everything to re be reported in this field, but in recognition that there may be some information that cannot be reasonably captured with this level of detail. Um, we, we, I, we, I would note, I mean, over the years, I mean, this, the reporting in this line has gotten better and better and more detailed, so it's pretty clear that uh, folks are you know, managing to report this with the level of detail we hope, but we do still have the unavailable field for those amounts, uh, which you know you simply, for whatever reason, have been unable to capture. Um, if you are planning on reporting based upon a coding system other than NAICS or SIC, you can use this other. I mean, ISO class codes, for example, you you can use that, but you do need to coordinate with ISO in connection with the information. Come on. Okay, moving to the next. Oh, that's right on it. Okay, this is the uh, places of worship template. It's similar to the policy industry worksheet that we just discussed in terms of the same premium element it seeks. Um, this is a was specifically requested by Congress, so we don't have any don't have any uh, discretion on this one. Um, it it seeks the same premium elements. Uh, as the, uh, the, the industry code worksheet we just discussed. Like that worksheet, it's also on a nationwide basis and seeks information in the general categories of property liability and workers' compensation. However, on this worksheet, we are only seeking information on policies written for places of worship. When you are reporting this data, uh, please do your best to, to not only report in, on coverage related to actual houses of worship churches, synagogues, mosques, the like, while excluding any affiliated religious organizations such as hospitals or schools. 
you will see that we ask you to report this information under, under a specific industry code. You can do this under the NAICS reporting system, SIC reporting system, or ISO class code. If you can report based upon one of these metrics, please do so. And again, we're only asking you to pick one. You don't need to you know, report the same information on each of them. Uh, if you cannot do uh, NAICS, SIC, or ISO class codes, but have some other way in which to extract the information, such as a policy name search, uh, please do that on the other uh, line. We do not have a category here for unavailable because we are specifically seeking data for places of worship. So please find some way in which to report the actual estimated information for policyholders in this category, particularly since our friends in Congress have asked us to do that. Um, for the workers' compensation element, the NCCI of California, WCIRB, or New York Bureau and can provide this information as well, so you don't need to fill out those particular fields here at the end of the form. Okay, moving on to geographic uh, exposures. Okay, again, this has not changed from prior years. Think of it as requesting the same sort of information that is requested by AM Best on its terrorism questionnaire. Geographic descriptions are the same as those used by AM Best. To aid in the reporting, we have also generated a complete list of zip codes for each of the jurisdictions listed on the worksheet. So if it is easier to use this to respond, you can do that. This document is available in Excel format on our website. Otherwise, use your best approximation of those areas. Again, the workers' compensation fields, um, yep, workers' compensation fields uh, will be reported, uh, completed by NCCI, California WCIRB, and the New York Bureau, but again, not the excess workers' compensation field. Um, we have under, entered an unavailable field here as well, so that is if you can't capture that, that can be entered there. Questions on page 10, uh, well, the next page, hold on, not page 10 anymore, page 11. Uh, seek uh, aggregations by, uh, yep, yeah, okay, here it is. Aggregations by particular zip codes and then uh, rank order those as requested. The questions in lines 49 and 50, by contrast, focus on a particular uh, location as distinguished from all locations within a particular zip code. Again, there have been no changes to this zip code, and again, it is heavily based upon the way in which AM Best does its uh, terrorism questionnaire. So if you're doing that, and I assume most of you are, uh, that information is largely important. Okay, last but certainly not least is the reinsurance uh, worksheet, which is uh, now starts at page 13 of this form. Uh, think of this, uh, this is answer the questions here for your private third party reinsurance protection. Do not include any um, intra company arrangements you may have in place. You need to answer the workers' compensation questions here as well, since the rating bureaus do not have such information and, and obviously can't report it for you. We ask for information here on that cat reinsurance for comparative purposes against terrorism risk reinsurance. Um, note that uh, the line uh, 26 question on reinsurance exclusions related to terrorism right in here. Um, Apart from uh, domestic and foreign uh, operations, this is meant to capture such situations as exclusions of risks at particular locations or within uh, metro certain metropolitan areas or that sort of thing. Uh, we continue to strongly recommend that if you have an individual responsible for reinsurance in your company that you forward this worksheet to them for completion. This will help ensure the accuracy of the data we receive. When responding to this worksheet, we need for you to enter actual figures, real numbers for the various fields. We understand that at, on a complex reinsurance program, it may be difficult to do that, but 
uh, a response along the lines of C chart or C attach summary, even if you're uploading the summary, uh, significantly runs the risk of information not getting aggregated. So really on each of these, please provide your best estimate of the number uh, that uh, of an actual number that should be entered in that field. And if you have any questions on that, please direct them to the Treasury or ISO. Uh, moving on to the next page, uh, this is this year's uh, model loss question. As you know, we we do this every year. Uh, figure out your total loss under your policies. Uh, well, actually, uh, this is that's line thirty. Lines 31 to 36 are essentially what will be the elements of loss associated with uh, uh, an event under a trip. Uh, obviously, policyholders are going to have uh, uh, an exposure based on the deductibles that are in their, their policies. That goes there. Uh, as you know, you have a trip deductible, which is 20% of your prior year um, uh, 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 premium in the trip eligible lines. Um, that needs to be paid before you can actually make a claim under trip. Uh, we, we assume and know that uh, uh, sometimes you get reinsurance for that. So you, we're asking you to give us what's your net loss of the amount within that deductible uh, versus your uh, what you might have gotten in terms of private reinsurance. Next is the uh, your claim under trip which is you know, basically 80% of once you, you figure out what the total loss associated with the event in question, you deduct the, uh, what your policyholders pay, you deduct what you pay in your deductible, what's left over, uh, you do have a claim under trip for 80% of that amount. And then uh, obviously the other 20% is the, what we call the copay layer, and that's the amounts in lines 35 and 36. And again, we assume there's a net amount there, um, which you pay without reinsurance, but that you might have reinsurance um, for um, some of that amount. Uh, you know, if you, obviously, uh, you know, you, once you figure out what the total loss associated under the policies is, once you enter the figures in lines 31 to 36, they do add up to the figure in 30. So. Uh, that's how that's, that should work. Uh, this year's scenario is focused on a location in downtown Miami, Florida. It involves a single uh, truck blast at a street intersection, and we provide GPS coordinates in the scenario description. There, right there. Uh, it should be considered to be a considered to be a single event for trip purposes, or a single event or occurrence for trip purposes meaning that you should only assume the payment of an individual trip deductible and otherwise you apply your policies if they are responding on a single event or occurrence basis. Um, only respond if you determine that one or more of your policies would be exposed to loss arising from the scenario, uh, obviously the first, and, and under a policy covering terrorism risk. Uh, we're not asking you to uh, figure out what policy, that, uh, for policyholders that may have gone bare and don't have terrorism risk insurance, obviously there could be some people falling into that category. We're not asking for those numbers. So take the policies that actually have terrorism risk insurance and then do the analysis. Um, I, I've just sort of gone through the, um, you know, what the, oh, and the one question, uh, one thing I would note on the deductible retention of insureds. Again, only fill that in on policies that are essentially primary level policies where your policy doesn't respond until that amount is satisfied. If you've got excess coverage uh, applicable to this, uh, just respond. I mean, don't put in any number that has to be satisfied before you get up to the excess coverage, whether it's a deductible or underlying coverage because otherwise, because that information is being reported. Otherwise, you get a lot of double counting, which uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't give us an accurate picture. Um, let's see. Uh, other than that, the scenario, uh, we do provide some information 
uh, concerning estimated employee injuries, but it does not require you to estimate any potential liability exposure. So again, this is a exercise for property insurance and workers' compensation payments only. Uh, don't, uh, and because of the difficulty of trying to figure out who might have liability for something, we're not asking here for any effort to try to uh, predict that. So, uh, after all that, uh, I don't have anything else in terms of what I've prepared. Um, Sherry, do you have any other questions in the chat box at this point? Uh, no questions thus far. Um, we, we are about to wrap up. Uh, as <laughs> we've given you our contact information, we are more than happy to respond to individual questions. I'll, I'll let this hang open for another minute if anybody wants to type anything. But uh, subject to that, uh, Mike, is there anything else on your front based upon anything I said or missaid on anything? I don't have anything else to do, Richard. Okay. Um, Sherry, still no questions? Still no questions. All right. Well, uh, again. Hold on, hold we, on, uh, hold, hold on, Richard, oh. Richard. Uh, we do have a question. Okay. <laughs> the question is, just to confirm, do places of worship still get included on the industry form, or are those kept separate? No, it, it, the places, yeah, consider the places of, don't, don't try to, your figures on the industry code should just incorporate them within whatever more general category they go into. We're not asking you to separate that out. We just want a, an accurate picture of what the experience is for places of worship, given the concern that was uh, expressed in the last trip reauthorization on that fund. So the same premium that's on the places of worship sheet should be on the general sheet as well, just separated out more detailed on the places of worship sheet. Uh, okay, well, um, sounds like we've been doing this long enough that everybody knows what to do, so that's good. Uh, I am going to uh, stop the recording now.